I was always pulled back to the martial arts, no matter where I was, what I was doing, I'd always see it. It was always flashed before me. Hey there, you're listening to Whistlecake Martial Arts Radio, episode 724, with my guest today, Tashi Mark Warner. I'm Jeremy Lesniak, host for the show, founder here at Whistlekick, where everything we do is in support of the traditional martial arts. If you want to know about everything we've got going on, check out whistlekick.com. That's where you'll find everything we're doing. It's also the place to find our store. Make sure you use the code PODCAST15 to save 15%. Now, our podcast, this show, gets its own website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. We bring you this show twice a week, and the goal of the show, and really of Whistlekick overall, it's to connect, educate, and entertain traditional martial artists throughout the world. If you want to show your appreciation for what we do, there are lots of ways you can do that. You can make a purchase, you could share an episode, or join the Patreon. P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash whistlekick. That's where you're going to go for that. Now, if you're unfamiliar with Patreon, it's a place where we post exclusive content, and you can get access to at least some of it for as little as two bucks a month. And there are different tiers with different rewards. Lots of value. Check it out. And if you want the full list, all the things that you can do to support us, as well as some exclusive behind the scenes stuff that for free, we update the family page once a week, whistlekick.com slash family. No button for that. No link for that. You got to type it in, but we do our best to make sure it's worthwhile. I've had the pleasure of getting to know Tashi Warner for really, it's been, it's been about a year and I'm glad we finally got to do this because this man has wonderful stories and brings a passion to the martial arts that I find infectious. He loves what he does. He is a consummate beginner in the best possible way. And I think you're going to find not only those things, but plenty of other things come through in our conversation here. Good morning. How are you? Very good. How are you today? I'm great. We are ready to go, I guess. We're ready to go. Yeah, we can just, I mean, you know what we do. We can just just roll, just start doing it. Sure. Let's dive right into it. Why'd you start training? I wanted to be Bruce Lee or maybe David Carradine at the time. This was back mm. in the day. So those are kind of the popular shows. I was brought up in a time when we had heroes, yeah. manly men. I'm, I'm going to say manly men. The time of John Wayne, ex- mm. Audie Murphy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I saw Bruce Lee and, and uh, David Carradine and their likes. I'm like, oh, wow, this is awesome. I got to do this. I was a teenager at the time. So that's what got me started. That's what got me going. That's Now, the why? I, 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 have a th- I have a theory, but instead of voicing it, I'll just ask you. Why <laughs> Bruce Lee, David Carradine and not John Wayne, Clint Eastwood and you know, men that I think would, would likely be considered more conventional male role models, especially of that time. Probably because at the time I was kind of an unconventional kid. I was mm. in the band, a band geek. Everybody who was in a band knows what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. And I saw this as something really cool. Actually, I thought it was really cool. I, I'm not going to say different or strange. But it's just really cool. And I, I get going and never stopped. Mm. Were you doing any other movement things? Were you playing sports? Oh, no. I was one of the other guys. Okay. And it's, it's, it's strange because I see a lot of my students who do music, art, and go that area. And then they come in and this is their movement. Yeah. So it's truly something I can relate to. Because it is called martial arts, and I see this movement as a true art. When you come into school and you start doing it, all of a sudden your body starts to to flow. Regardless of who you are, your body will flow. Uh, I'll go into this real quick. I had scoliosis. I lived with scoliosis. And so I wasn't one of the jump up in the sky, slip around, do all this stuff. But at the same time, my body started to move, and I, I got this feeling that I can do this. I can do this. Anybody can do this. And that's the beautiful thing about martial arts. And you're talking about the other sports, and if you're not a number one in your game, 
well, we might not want you in this sport. We want right. him there who can move really good. Right. Okay. Right. So you, you've you laid out a stack of things that I, I think to the casual observer might suggest that your, your entry and involvement in martial arts is kind of a statistical anomaly. You said you started in 74, right? Yep. Okay. Yep. So you started at a time when you're an older kid, but you're still a kid, and most schools aren't teaching kids back then. And there's a there's a physical component mm-hmm. uh, kind of pulling you back, and in such a way that I would imagine there were at least some schools back then that would say, "We can't help you." You know, we've heard of accounts like that on this show. Um. And personality wise, it doesn't sound like we would consider teenage Mark to be the most likely person to get involved in a physical pursuit. Well, from my perspective or their perspective, I I know you do a lot of uh, traditional Taekwondo and you've done traditional karate. Mm -hmm. I went to a Kempo school. It was actually, at the time, it was Univer- uh, United Studios of Self Defense. Mm-hmm. It was run by Rob, Bob Mazzara, who later broke off, started his own lineage later on, later, his own school later on. But that's where I started. And they tended to take more students in from all aspects. They had, mm-hmm. at the time, I think I, as a teen, I went into the adult classes. And their program seemed to adapt to what I could do in the very beginning. Did you, did you know that going in? Like, did you research schools and, oh, this is one that will accept me or was it just luck? Oh, no, I just found it. Okay. It was just, it's like, okay, well, oh, that's a school. Let's go. I was gone. I was there that quick in. What did so, your parents think? Well, they, now. <laughs> you, for those of you listening, he just smirked. There, there, yes. There's a story here. There's something here. Well, now we start to go back through time because both my parents had, had lived through the depression and that gave them an impacting on their brain what things were about. My father was a World War II veteran. Mm-hmm. So now you get to see how old I am a little bit. And he, he went through that. He was actually third day in D-Day. He was a combat engineer. And actually his unit was relieved by the 101st at Beston. So there's some history for you kids Go and Google it. See what I'm talking about. 101st at Baston. His unit was relieved by them. He, they pulled out. They, 101st went in. That's, that's a history lesson. And that's, history is a beautiful thing. So check it out, kids. And in their minds, I should have grown up. I should have went to work in a, in, in a factory, got a good living. I should have been another baby boomer like they were. I was one of their children, so I was a baby boomer. And I should have built my life that way. Mm. This was just kind of a hobby for me. And they thought it was a hobby for me. And and I remember that. The first, my first uh, Blackwell graduation graduation that my mother ever went to was for my fifth done, my fifth degree. And she finally was in the audience. And I ran out and gave her a hug. And we get a picture of that somewhere flown around here. So that's something, uh, that's something, that's another memory that sticks with you. Well, why, why not any of the, the, the earlier ranks? I mean, hobby or not, were, were they not supportive? Ah, so let me give you the other side of the coin. Because like I said, I was in the high school band, right? right. Every single concert, every single thing that I did in high school, mom was in the audience watching. So there we have the two sides of the coin. One was, oh, yeah, this is high school. This is music. This is good. And the other is, oh, that's that martial arts stuff over there. There was a validity or a credibility to her, Mm -hmm. to what you did within the context of school. Outside of school, they didn't stop you, but it doesn't sound like they were conventionally supportive. You turn on the radio, you can listen to music all day long. You have to go find the podcast, though, right? They didn't understand it. No, no. It was, like I said, the way that they were brought up. I mean, if you think about what we know of the uh, 
uh, of the uh, tw- around 1927, all the depression and stuff. That was quite the time. My grandmother, oh, we're going way back now. My grandmother would talk about, this was in Byfield, Massachusetts, if you know where that is. She talked about having to go through a field that had a bull in it, and the bull would chase her through the field. So that's, that's, we we're going way back then. But this is some of the thoughts that ran through their heads. Uh, my father was from Waterboro, Maine. It was a really cool thing happened. I'm going to tell you this. this we were way off track, but that's okay. Really cool thing. I went up visiting a few years ago, happened to, to go to an art museum up in Portland, Maine. And in this art museum, for some reason, they had the door from 1940-something, 40, early 40s, from Waterboro, Maine. Just the door of the post office. I'm sitting there looking at it going, my God, my father would have stood in front of this door. So oh, that cool. was just, just wild stuff like that. Yeah. Just keep happening. So myself, I'm truly a believer in karma. Mm. So everything's karma. And I, I don't pronounce it right, but that's it. That's okay. <laughs> um, now, I, I know you had a track after high school where... You know, maybe, maybe there was a little bit of, of I'm going to speculate, trying to make your parents happy with your choices? Well, I would go the other way. And it wasn't trying, okay. to, trying, to, trying to make them unhappy. It was trying to find my way. Okay. And I'm always telling the kids at my school, find your passion now. And one of the biggest reasons I say that is because after school, I worked for a while, studied martial arts, as as always. But I was heading down the path that they wanted me to go. And I'm like, sure. uh, no. So I went off and I joined the military, joined the army, and went away for a while. That was intriguing. Now, like I said, I had scoliosis. So that wasn't the, that was not the wisest choice I could make. Did you have to lie about that to get in? Well, I, would, we have, I, would have, I would have assumed that would have been a disqualification. Yeah, but you're 20 years younger than me, right? So we have to <laughs> go back. To, we have to go back to a history again. So when I joined the military, it was right after the Vietnam War. I didn't go into the Vietnam War. I was after I was early 80s. In fact, I was like 23. I was an old guy to go in. I remember. I just, here's another story for you. you know, full of stories. Full of I love stories. stories. Or, or full of something. I don't know what. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm in there and, and they, uh, first I have flat feet. I have flat feet. I have scoliosis. They didn't say anything. They said, walk like a duck. Walk like a duck. Okay. So then this is the one that got me. I, I got to the eye exam where they check colors Mm -hmm. and they had, they had all the dots on the page with the numbers in there. And the guy had the, the guy had the cards. And every time he flip a card, he'd tell me the number. He'd whisper the number. Whisper the number. Whisper the number. I'm like, okay, I guess I did this one. So at the time, they kind of, I think, would you're, take- col- you're colorblind too. No, I'm not colorblind. I could oh, see okay. him, but he 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 was, he was quicker than I could ever be. Oh, all right. Twenty three, forty two, one. Nine. All right, I guess I got this one. So I had a pulse, so they took me. <laughs> okay. And I was off. Onto right, that event. Po- po- Post Vietnam, there was tremendous concern. Right. Cold War. Yep. Okay. Makes sense. Well, even not so much that is that a lot of people who went to Vietnam, Vietnam were mm-hmm. not considered heroes back in those times. Right. In fact, one of my one of my buddies in the service went home on leave, and he went to a movie where he wore his dress uniform, and people were making noises, had cat calls and stuff. I know that all that's changed now, and they respect everybody who's done their military service. Thank God. Because they, they are the ones out there putting it. Yeah. I mean, if you, you, you talk about beating your body up. Yeah, that's what yeah. we did. We beat our bodies. One of the best ways I've heard it expressed is you can, you can support the soldiers and still not support the war. Yes, exactly. That's, that's the best way to put it, right there. Because funny thing about soldiers in wars, what are we doing there? I heard, I heard a story once you should take the two leaders the two leaders or the two countries give them whatever they want to use and just put them in the ring and okay, 
You solve it right here. You too. Just you too. Mm. It's, it's, it's interesting you bring that up. The timing of this, I'm pretty sure the episode Andrew and I recorded, well, I'm either going to get it right or wrong. We did an episode talking about how fighting really isn't in, in the way that we think about it in the modern landscape isn't quite natural. And I brought up the example that in a lot of historical cultures, there were battles between champions instead of sending everybody to war and yep. losing all these lives. Like you right. pick your best person and you pick your best. Well, mm -hmm. I think it's always, always male, at least in the cultures that I'm aware of, you pick your best guy and your best guy and you guys go yep. fight and it's a proxy battle. And then whoever wins that side wins, whatever they're trying to win. That's if you're going to fight, that would be the best way to do it. Least damage. I what were you doing between 18 and 23? I was working and I was training. Okay. A little slower, slower back then, a little slower training back then. Once in a while, I go off course being an 18, 23 year old, but then I always get back on course. Then I went in the service. But still tempo. Bit, yep. Still tempo, still at the same school. Okay. I got up to my brown belt before I went in the service. I okay. didn't, didn't, didn't get all the way to black before I went in the service. How, how long did you train? Okay, you took breaks. That makes sense. Yeah, That's I, went, okay. I went from 16 to 23, but okay. when, you're, when you're not as intelligent as you should be and you take too many breaks and mm. go off, and, uh, well, another bit of history. When I was 18, the drinking age was 18. <laughs> Got now, it. My, my parents didn't. Have, my parents didn't train me on how to drink properly, so I kind of had to figure that out on my own. Mm -hmm. So that was one of those one of those rinks right there. Yeah. So I, I, another part of me says, if this country is going to sell alcohol, then parents should be training their children how to drink. But then you have the other side of the coin, which says, no, mm -mm, it's not done that way. <laughs> but that's another story for another day. Okay. So you go in. They 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 pretty much rubber stamped you oh yeah yeah what'd Gone. you do what'd you do in the service i was well this is where john wayne comes into play i was in the infantry i was in the united states infantry i was mm, hardcore man that was interesting uh i was in the infantry i spent uh two tours in korea i went over there for a couple of years mm -hmm. that was that's another story for a whole nother podcast and i was at fort polk louisiana you, a funny thing, while I was at Fort Polk, Louisiana, I never went to Mardi Gras. Hmm. I never went down there. I should have went down there for three days, but never went to Mardi Gras. But that's, that's yeah, that's pretty good. Okay. And I, I, you know, we, we've heard time and again, folks who dabble in martial arts or start martial arts go into the service. And it seems like one of two things happen either martial arts falls off for them or they end up meeting someone training with someone they're stationed somewhere where there's nothing to do when they start training, et cetera. And they become more immersed in martial arts and their martial arts training. But I'm going to go ahead. I tended to dabble. I did a uh, little bit more Kempo while I was down at for a poke and just a little bit of Taekwondo in Korea. Okay. Again, I was going through a time of personal development. I'll put it that way because it's, that's a nice way to put it. So I only devil while I was in the service. When I got out, that's when I got into it. That's when I really got into it. Did something happen or were you, did you find that you were missing it? Like, like what you're, you're, the way you're expressing that makes it sound like, okay, I'm out. I'm ready martial arts is a thing for me this is what i something i want to put some effort into is that something you're saying in hindsight or was that something that you were aware of feeling at the time that's something i'm saying in hindsight okay i got out of the service and i actually went to a actually the chinese i rem, see i remember these details it was a chinese restaurant i would happen to be there with a buddy of mine mm -hmm. we were having a few cold ones and i looked up and i saw him doing his helicopter kick Jean-Claude Van Damme, blood sport. I'm like, yep, that's it, right there. And all of a sudden, it just, everything just flowed through me. I'm like, this is what I've been training for. And that is what I had been training for. I did not know it. 
like I said, I believe in karma. I didn't know what was going on, but at that point, I figured out. And when I did open my school in 98, it's like, I'm here. This is, this is what I'm supposed to be. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. This is my whole life has got me to the, this point and the next point. When did you leave the service? Uh, 86. Okay. So what happened in those 12 years? In those 12 years, I was training and I actually around 92, 94, I started teaching for Bob Missouri. He had Mm -hmm. had his own school at the time. So I started teaching at one of his schools. And then I decided to open my own school. Okay. Which was a great six years later. Yep. 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 Okay. What was teaching something that you were interested in and wanted to do? Or was it something that maybe he said, Hey, Mark, I I need you to teach this class over here. And you said, okay. Oh yeah, that was it. He he wanted (laughs) me. I said, said, okay. But after that, just started a steamroll. Like, oh, you enjoyed it. Yes, I enjoyed it. What what was it about teaching that you you enjoyed? What was it about teaching? It was I was I was doing something I love to do. Okay. I was doing martial arts, and I was almost making a, a living at it. So that was a good thing. I'm like, oh, this is this is pretty good. I can do this. And I I was doing tournaments. I loved to do tournaments mm-hmm. at the time. So that was more personal growth growth for me doing tournaments, teaching classes, watching a lot of more martial arts movies. Mm. I was having, this, time of, this is the time of my life. This is great. What I'm hearing, correct me if I'm wrong, what I'm hearing is this kind of thread of you looking around, trying things, experiencing things. Everything's okay, but not quite finding let's say a home, but throughout maybe realizing again, in hindsight, because we rarely realize these things at the time that there's this common thread of martial arts that seems to weave through everything. And you're like, you know, this stuff isn't that bad. Maybe, maybe I'll jump in with both feet. Both feet. I was always pulled back. Hmm. I was always pulled back to the martial arts, no matter where I was, what I was doing. I'd always see it. It was always flashed before me. While I was stationed in Korea, there were there's the uh, Katusas, the Koreans that arguments the U.S. Army, mm-hmm. and one of them had done some kung fu. So I said, "Okay, let's go." So even at that moment, I did one or two classes with him. I was pulled back into it. It, it just appeared wherever mm-hmm. I, wherever I am. It just appears. This rack of stuff behind me. This those are all memories. Mm-hmm. I can go right down that rack and give you. Memory from each one of those. If, if you're if you're listening rather than watching, it's a it's a weapons rack, sticks and knives and mm-hmm. all kinds of pokey and smacky things. Yeah. Each each one here. I'll give you this. This is this is a different one. It is a, a small, yeah. wide blade pair of knives. Single knife yeah. pair of knives. These are butterfly okay. swords. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, everybody knows that does Wing Chun. I'm going to talk to the Wing Chun practitioners, all the Kung Fu practitioners. The Wing Chun is a Southern Chinese art. I got these in Death Feng, China, when I w- took a trip over there to the Shaolin Temple in that area. Okay. So, in China, it's as big as the U.S. In the China's long yeah. yeah. My mom loved it when I was, went to China. I got a phone call once. There's an earthquake in China. I'm like, we're not going to that area. We're going way over the other end. So that was the earthquake. And let me guess. She said, "Just be careful." Of course, because that's, be that's that's every that's every mom when their kid takes a trip. Doesn't matter how old. Just, um, just be careful. I'm worried about you. Yeah. Now, I'll go. I'll go up a few years. When you get to China, okay. if you go to that thing, this. All right. Now I'm gone. Now all right. So, ow. Who's what? What is the biggest school that you know of over here? Martial arts school. For here, I know a few schools that are in the two hundred and fifty to three hundred student mm-hmm. range. Well, I was at a school that had ten thousand students, and it was not <laughs> the biggest one. Wow! Because after they get out, their bodyguards, movie stars, 
and they go that line. So they do like f- four hours in the morning. Then they go to school and they do four hours in the afternoon, martial arts training. I was up at six. They were out there training. They trained for like two hours before they go to breakfast. These are all ages. So that's, that was quite the experience. That was one of the experience. And they do all, they, they practice everything. I've, I've heard people say that, that Shaolin Kung Fu is not good. I, I'm not going to go up against those guys. I've seen it. I actually, my instructor over there, Shefu Shetty Chung, comes over here twice a year. Mm-hmm. And he teaches. And he, he taught me this wrist lock with a sm- smile on his face. He's a Buddhist. He's a Buddhist monk. He teaches me his wrist lock with a ru- a smile on his face. I'm like, he could snap my wrist, wrist real quick with that one. So we were over there, went over there. Now, downtown, there's many shops for either the students or the tourists. Mm-hmm. And they're loaded with martial arts weapons. Mm-hmm. I'm like, oh, this is awesome. And of course, I brought a few things. True. Then you get up to Shaolin Temple itself. It's, there are students up there, but during the day, it's very, very, very touristy now, mm-hmm. which is great for the martial arts. Everybody gets to go see this area. My opinion about Shaolin Temple, it's like a university. It's where they keep all the knowledge of all the different Kung Fu styles. If you, if you study into the, into Sha, the Shaolin arts, you have the different areas. You have, uh, uh, backdoor boxing, eight boxing, you have your mantis. You have all these different styles of martial arts that's actually taught at Shaolin Temple. So there's your university. Mm-hmm. Is it the birthplace of martial arts? Uh, probably not because Shaolin Temple is only like 2,000 years old. Chinese martial arts has been around at least 5,000 years. Mm-hmm. I think I got that right. So, but it is like a university. And it's a university. Universities are full of knowledge. So then, I got to go to Bodas Damo's cave up in the mountain. Okay. You may have heard the legends. I have. Can, mm. can you can you tell us the legend of Damo in his cave? Yeah. Oh, the legend of Damo. He 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 was. You know who he was, right? No. Oh, good. I don't know. I don't know this name. He was. I, I'm, I'm embarrassed. I feel like I should the way you're the way you're saying this, but. Well, oh, yes. yes. All right. Give me that name. Bodhidharma. So, because he was, he was an uh, Indian monk who brought Buddhism. Well, he was, actually, he was not the first. He was like the third abbot of Shaolin, the third room there. He brought, brought, into, uh, brought Buddhism from India into China, mm-hmm. Chan Buddhism. And they say that he found the monks who were studying the Buddhism weak. So he went, they say he went up into the mountain for nine years and, and gazed into the wall. I've been up the mountain. I went up the mountain. And if you ever hear anybody say, why do those monks run up the mountain every day? Tell them to go walk over the mountain one time. They'll know why the monks run up the mountain. Now it's hard. It used to be easy. It used to be easy because there used to be trails going up the mountain. Now it's stairs. So now they're running upstairs. Mm. The top. You walk in there. You walk into that cave. You're like, oh, my God. I, w- I almost dropped to my knees when I walked into the cave there. So my impression was, and I actually saw the room where he stayed at Shaolin Temple. My impression was he'd, he'd walk up the mountain in the morning, meditate in the cave, and then came, come down the mountain. And then, of course, he came up, up with some of his internal energy pro, uh, things. That's where you com- start to combine the internal with the external in martial arts. That's what he brought into it. That's what he put into it. And that's a very important element that we need and that many people are lacking. Mm-hmm. If you start to get your internal running, working, then it brings your abilities up further and further. Oh, there I am. So where was I? I was in China somewhere. So we we, we kind of we took a tangent, and I, and and I, I'd like to tangent back. All right, we can do that. Why did you open a school? Because when when we kind of left off, you were you were teaching, you were almost making a living teaching. You didn't have the responsibility of having to run the school or make the rent or deal with any of the multitude of things that everybody listening knows comes from owning a school and yet you 
made the conscious choice at some point. Nobody ever opens it. Well, we have heard a couple of stories, people opening schools accidentally, but very rarely does someone open a school accidentally. There is a decision. There's intent, probably even a conversation with your instructor as you decide to go open your own school. How'd that happen? Hmm. For, for, for more knowledge of the martial arts, that's why I opened my school. Say more. I, when I started the martial arts, when I started the martial arts, I love watching martial arts movies. So I saw, uh, oh, what's his name? He's the bad guy, on, the big bad guy on Cobra Kai now. Uh, Martin Cove? No, the one, the other one. Oh, the guy who plays Terry Silver. Yes, yes. Yeah, I forget the actor's name. I saw him do a really easy armbar. Hmm. And I, like, I want to do that. I want to be able to do that. I was, I was like a brown belt at the time, something like that. I'm like, oh, I want to learn how to do that. So it, it's this type of searching for knowledge that I wanted. I also watched the Stuart Kwan videos to try to pick up some stuff. And I get mm -hmm. this easy, really easy technique of it. I took it to my school and showed it. And, and the instructor's like, oh, we don't do that here. I'm like, mm, well, why not? Oh, it's not part of our curriculum. Okay. So these instances got me looking for explanations as to what I was doing. Hmm. It culminated with me opening my school. And that started a whole new journey. Hmm. Because at the time, I was teaching Kempo Karate. And like, okay, let's see where I can go with this. Let's see what I can do with this. Mm. Let's see how there are no bad arts. But you need really good teachers in the arts. I'm going to drop a name about one of the good guys in the arts, Craig Wareham. Mm -hmm. Been on the show he, a number of times. He's taken his art. He's done what I did not do. He's taken his art to the next level. Whereas I went off in another direction. But well, at, 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 the, at the risk of, you know, injecting information, because generally I, I come into these episodes and I don't know a lot of the detail. Mm -hmm. But in this case, I do. You just told us that your instructor said this isn't part of the curriculum. They put up a, a wall for you. Whereas Craig's instructor has... Not only not done that, but been in, has encouraged him in the other direction. Well, yeah, right. But then again, if you look at Craig's instructor, his instructor was my instructor. Mm. So people branched off and said, "We need, okay. little, I see we, need we need to encourage our students to be better than we were." Mm. And that's what myself and I know Craig's instructor does too. Now, many people say that. Many people, I've heard a lot of people say that we want our students to be better than we were. And no, they really don't. Do you think they think they want it? Or do you think they're aware that they're not being truthful? I think deep downside, they have to be aware. That's why I'm where I, that's why I am where I am right now is because even though with all my physical, physical, physical holding me back, I still felt like I could do more. Mm. And it's funny because when I talk to these, when I talk to these people, most of the time I encourage them, let me help you build your school. Let, let's do stuff together to build mm. your school, make you better. And nope, 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 nope. They say no. So now I am where I am, doing what I'm doing, working with all kinds of great people. In fact, I'm 63, and I just started working with, with uh, Stephen Watson a little bit. Nice. Doing who's some been, who's been on the show? Yeah, yeah. So it's this continuing education for myself and my students that we all need to uh, keep up, keep going, mm. keep rocking and rolling. What's your mindset? You know, because I'm sure we'll get into it. You know, you're, 
you currently train and teach a variety of things. And I, and I know there's some blurriness to it in the way you present it to your students, but you're active with a few things. So what, which I, I would imagine that you've got to be choosy. You, you don't have time to train everything with everyone. So there's a decision process in there. So when, when you experience something, when you meet someone like Stephen Watson and you say, you know, I, I think this is someone I want to train with, what's that decision process like? Why, maybe not specifically him, but why in general might you at your age, your rank, your degree of experience want to take on another instructor? Well, for us, let me go ahead. Experience has nothing to, to do with, I mean, experience has nothing to do with what I need, need or want to learn. Huh? If you look at the world of martial arts, it's, it's so vast. I mean, I was recently at your weekend. I was learning a lot of great stuff, mm -hmm. getting a, a lot of great influence. So, believing that I have the ultimate experience and knowledge would put a limitation on what I want to do. Wow, that's kind of like Bruce Lee thing, wasn't it? That's cool. That's true. So there should be no, you should always be learning from someone. I think the re one of the reasons that was Stephen is because he once said, yes, if you have no one, you should learn from the rocks and the trees. I think he said that on your show at some point. And I, I've known him for a while, so that was a good, I think that was a really good decision. Uh, went off track here somewhere. <laughs> Now, with, with everything I've done, and like I said, I believe in karma, and I believe everything motivates me, gets me to the next point, so I can, so I can teach the next generation, basically. Mm -hmm. So, uh, most of the time, I did not find the arts. The arts found me. A lot of, uh, after, I get, after I opened my school, the arts started to find me. I was on the tournament circuit, Back in 98, 99, that's where I met Sifu Scott Jeffrey, my, my uh, Northern Mantis instructor. I've been with him since 98. And he led me to uh, Shefu Shiri Chung over in China for the Shaolin. Shefu used to come, he, he'll be coming over again after the clear up a little bit. Pre COVID, he'd come over once a year. His, his assistant would come, come over the other half of the year. So we had one at one end, one at the other. Then I started training with uh, Mike Williams in 2007, doing some Kali. He introduced me to my Kali instructor right now, uh, Tuan uh, Nene Tortel. And Mike also introduced, introduced me to my Ceylon instructor, Edward Levy. So these are the experiences that I just flow into. Okay. So I, I, I think it's an important question. So I'm, I'm going to go back. I'm going to ask it again. Who makes, and I'll ask it a different way, who makes the cut? How do you decide I'm going to invest the time to train with this person in this art versus the vast majority? You're not training. You will never have the ability to train with most people. Why do you choose the people that you choose? Why do I choose the people that I choose? You know, that's the way we avoid a question. We repeat the question, right? It, it, it can also buy you time. Yes, yes. As you start to think, it's an easy way to create a, create space mm -hmm. in a conversation that doesn't require a lot of thought, so you can digest a bit more and maybe come to the beginning of what you want to say. Yep, exactly. Well, uh, like I said, I don't have the time. I don't pick the teachers or the style. The styles and the teachers pick me. At this point in my life, I like to train with, actually, although they're my teachers, they're also my allies now. Mm. I, I train with allies. That's yes, a word I don't know that we generally hear on this show. What do you mean by ally? I'll go back to what I said before. If I came to you as a teacher and said, I want to help you expand your school expands your way of thinking. And you go, no, 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 no. Well, that's not an ally. That's just a teacher. Mm -hmm. An ally is a teacher that will work 
I believe this is the direction that all all instructors go. Now, a lot of the instructors I'm meeting now, thank you very much, are allies. And they're all thinking the same things. I see them helping their students. You, you see all these, these good instructors helping their students up. The instructor that I'm working with, with now, pushing their, instru- their students this way, mm. push them, pushing them up over their heads. Mm. That's a great visual. Those are allies. Those are more than just teachers. Allies are more than just teachers. It's someone you work in conjunction with, synchronicity with. Uh, like I said, I've known Stephen for Stephen for a couple of years, five, six years now. Mm-hmm. So it, at this point, I'm like, yeah, it's time. And it, it's funny because I was taking a, taking a Zoom class with him, doing mm-hmm. Zoom, and I even sent him a message. I said, "That was awesome. I learned so much about what I thought I already knew." And and, it, and is is that the goal? Is it to refine specific things? Is it, hey, I'm going to be an open book and I'll let you cram whatever knowledge you want in my face? You know, again, because you're, you, you occupy a, a, an interesting place in the martial arts landscape in that the vast majority of people who started training roughly around the time that you trained are based on my observation, they have existed in a single style at any given time. And most of them have maybe switched style once. You know, they started in this and then they switched over to this after 10, 15, 20, 30 years, right? And you, just just in the way, and so so folks who have not been on the show, um, you may not know that we do this, but we, we ask all of our guests to submit uh, a form. You know, we ask a handful of questions. It's to help guide not only my role here on the show, but to get the the guests to think about a few things. And you listed off not only the arts that you are active in, but the very specific flavors or lineages of those arts in a mm-hmm. way that most people do not do. Right? You um and so I, I might be falling down in, in informing this question. But where I think I'm trying to go, let me try it again, given that context I just laid out. I can help you out. Okay, go for it. If you know where I'm going, please pick up the ball. Lineage is very important. Good lineage is more important. And I'm going to go back to the all-in all in weekend. When I crossed hands with Andrew, Andrew Adams. I was amazed because he's the karate kick. But he, he, he was so sensitive. I was like, where does this, this come from? This comes from lineage and training. So the people that have the proper lineage and training, they should stay with their eye. Maybe do a little cross training here and there. But when I crossed hands with him, it was like, this is awesome. This is great. Somebody who's trained in one art for so long and is able to do this, when you think of karate kick, it's just strong, blasting punches. I never found that. I'm starting to find that now. I had a, like Stephen Watson, I'm dropping names like I'm dropping names and stuff. He he said, train with trees, trees and stones. That's what I did for a long time to find my way. Now I'm starting to, to find people who give the stronger lineages. The, I haven't held on to all my lineages because they're off with doing other things. They're off doing other things. Not so much I am. Like I said, arts find me and arts lose me. But like I said, the, the kind of lineage I, I saw up there was like, yeah, this is something. This is something it, special. It, it, sound, it sounds like we're, we're hearing a, a variant on the when the student's ready, the master appears. Yes. Is, is, that, yep. is that a good way to put it? These things pop up for you and you're like, hmm, it's time for that. And you trust your gut. 
that a good way to put it? I would have to switch that one. Okay. Because as I, where I have come from and where I've been. So now it's when the master is ready, the student will appear. I'm there. Okay. That's a, I think that's a, probably a deep distinction. Can you expand on that? It's, it's actually probably more symbiotic. Okay. Than that. We kind of find each other hmm. because I've been ready for a long time. Getting to the right point was my journey. Hmm. The pe people I work with now pretty much are all on the same page. They want to. They want to promote the martial arts. They want to promote their students. They want to promote good feelings. They want everyone to have good feelings, be smiling and laughing. I'm going to go back. I'm going. I'm going off again. This is. This was at a, a tournament that me and Craig Graham were at. This is. <laughs> he's going to love this. And we're sitting there, and of course, he runs his school. I run mine. We had two students sparring each other. And he's standing here, and I'm standing here. And all of a sudden, he starts talking to students. I'm like, all right. I start talking to mine. And we're coaching our students. And we go, kick, kick, kick. He's, he's next to me. He's like, block the kick, kick, kick. And we're over there. We're laughing. We're having a great time as we're coaching our students. The great thing about that was the laughter, having a great time. That's what that, that whole day turned into. Now, he's only 30 years old, but I think he, he's, he's awareness. I think he's a lot more aware a lot than a lot of the uh, instructors I know. Anybody who's had the chance to work with Craig or even just know knows Craig from the context of a whistle kick and his, um, and I think he appreciates holding this record. Most number of appearances on martial arts radio without having a formal interview episode like this knows that Craig is, Craig is a unique individual. And it's, it's one of the reasons I consider him such a good friend. And when I think about the dynamic between you and Craig, it makes me wonder. And so let me ask, let, let me let me go back again and, and ask this question in a different way, not because I'm trying to beat a dead horse, but because there, there's something that my gut tells me I'm trying to pull out of this. And I trust my gut when it comes to doing this show. Would it be fair to say that when you know, you 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 flip the statement when the student ready is ready, the master will appeal. You, you said when the master is ready, the student will appear. Is it fair to say that as we connect these various pieces, it's an exchange that the instructors you take on would likely just as readily say, I'm going to learn just as much having Mark as a student as you would say, I'm going to learn just as much from having this person as my instructor. Is it that sort of collaborative teaching environment? A lot of it. A okay. lot of this. It may not be the, it may not be the, uh, the physical aspect. Mm -hmm. but there's a definitely a collaboration. Uh, like with my instructor in the Philippines, uh, Nene Jerson Totel. As a definite collaboration there. I mean, we, we're we working together to strengthen his art a little bit. Mm. So, uh, and with Craig, Craig walked in my door. I'm like, oh, what do you need? And for those because, that don't know, you are Craig's Wing Chun teacher. Kung Fu Kali teacher? Kali teacher. Kung Fu and Kali. Kung Fu and Kali, okay. But his mind's so open that he's ready for whatever I put into it. And I know we'll go, we'll go there. Same tournament, right? I'm sitting there. I'm watching all my students. All of a sudden, I see this student over here doing some kung fu that I taught Craig. A big smile comes on my face. I'm like, this is awesome. And of course, they're competing against my students, but it's still so awesome to see this stuff. So it's this kind of collaborations that we need everywhere. No stopping, no hesitation. Hmm. No, it's not me and mine. No, it's you and yours. And now that's what I get from my instructors. It's ours. Mm. It's not in mine. It's not you. It's ours. Mm. Does that help? Or did I go off in another time? No, no, it's beautiful. You, you, you know the show. You know there's no, there's no bad direction. 
no bad direction. Wow. <laughs> At least we really haven't had one yet, you know, you mean seven years in. You, you've put a lot of pieces together for yourself as a martial artist over your, your time training. How do you distill or convey that for your students? Slowly. And it's getting slower all the time, which is a good thing. Mm. Because somebody, you, <laughs> now. And it's actually a good thing because now that I step back and I'm starting to slow down, I'm going, you've got me going, you, ain't you, it's your fault. You've got me going back to where I began. Mm. Nothing but pure heart and soul and passion. I didn't worry about other stuff. I'm getting more and more like that again. I don't worry about other stuff. So what do you mean I by say, other stuff? What's the other stuff? I, 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 I think you call them thumbs in the belts, walking around, that kind of stuff. Okay. All that kind of stuff. Con- concer- concern with things that are not uh, and, the desire to become better. Right, exactly. So now when I'm teaching this strike here, I'll break I'll break it down. We're striking with the palm. These, this today and we'll strike with the palm. Then we can we we can engage the fingers. Let's get out the let's get out some pads. Mm-hmm. Let's get out the uh, the mung bean pads. We'll toss them back and forth so you can see how this feel. We'll hit them like this. We'll get the clap pads. So I can I'll teach that for like fifteen minutes. Just that one hand position. They enjoy it. They love it. The feelings that are coming from me. That's that's what I'm doing now. That's how I'm conveying things. If you get back to it, you we're always hearing that all martial arts is one mountain. So all the martial arts I teach will go right up there. We'll bring us right up there. And when I, when I teach a front punch, very traditional, right from here. Make sure it's guided where it should be, the way it's taught, the way it should be. The fundamentals are all fundamental. But when you get down to your fundamentals, they're all the same, pretty much the same across the board. There may be a few slight differences. I like to talk, I like to say that about uh, like like chicken, different spices on chicken. You have Italian chicken, Chinese chicken, you have uh, Filipino chicken. What spice do you want on chicken? Chicken. So we all have chicken, and it's just the spices that you put put on top of it. That's what's going to make the difference. But if you don't cook the chicken right, it's not going to be good, no matter what you put on top of it. The first time I've heard that analogy, and I love it. I love it because it, it, it it's it's two factor, right? The the mountain analogy is wonderful. And for those of you who haven't heard it, you're probably new to the show if that's the case. But it's this idea that. As martial artists, we all start at different places at the base of the mountain. And as we progress, we're moving up the mountain. Some of us have a more circuitous path than others. But as we get closer to the top of the mountain, we become closer to each other. You know, Mark and I may start on opposite sides of the mountain with our training and be, you know, miles away from each other as we move up. We now are closer and you can generally see that in in what we do. But this idea with the chicken, I, I like that better because we're talking, it, it, it brings in this notion that sometimes the chicken's not cooked well and it can make you sick. And not yes. only does it, you know, not taste good, it doesn't feel right in your mouth, mm-hmm. but this, how you spice it is irrelevant at that point. Right, Exactly. When I originally heard the, the mountain thing, I heard uh, a Chinese version. I heard mm. beyond mountain, another mountain, beyond that mountain, sky. Mm. So I, my, originally, in my mind, it was like, oh, I, I have an art here, have another art there behind, another art over there, and then we have the sky. So mm. martial arts became a lifelong process, and all these different arts became another passion. Another yeah. passion. I'll say it like that. I mean, people will call me insane, and they, they're probably right for trying to do <laughs> arts. But it's it's a lifelong passion. It's something that I want, and I want to hand over to my students. 
And seeing that I'm not married, don't have any kids of my own, I consider all my students my family. Now even have extended family. Right. Okay. So when, when, when you think about this journey that you've been on, one of the things that's striking me as very interesting is that you are, you are at an age where a lot of martial artists start to narrow. I'm not going to say they're closing their mind, but I, I will say that as we get older, our willingness to start over, put on a white belt, whatever you want to call it, take a new teacher, seems to diminish. It almost sounds like you're going in the opposite direction. Oh, yes. You're becoming more open to learning more things, new things. Oh, yes. So if we take that and we extend a few more years, will you can, do you think you'll continue to add more new instructors or arts? Are you going to close, you know, lock the door on any of the ones that you have? Or are you just going to keep stacking? Stacking? I don't. See, I, stacking is not the word that I would use. Okay. Training, yes. Stacking, no. It's like it's like the Tai Chi Chuan I'm working with Steven now. Mm -hmm. Called the Grand Ultimate Fist. How many forms do they, do they have? They have one open hand form. Maybe some variance off of that. So why would that be the Grand Ultimate Fist? Because Tai Chi Chuan does everything for you. It's not only... It's physical, mental, and spiritual. Mm -hmm. So you have all these elements involved. And there's more to that art than people think. And I could go on for hours with just that art, but I won't. I'm going to continue with my doors wide, with my eyes wide open, looking mm -hmm. at everything. Like I said, man, I just, I just crossed hands with a karate kid going, oh my God, look at this. This guy's no knows he's sensitive. I started watching uh, Jesse M. Kemp. Mm -hmm. He's remarkable. Karate kick. I'm like, where's this? I do have this. I do have a personal secret that's starting to evolve a little more. Most of my primary instructors aren't were not aren't here in the U.S. Hmm. Uh, it seems that you're calling. You're saying stacking. I'm actually reducing things. I think, even though my eyes are wide open here in the United States, I believe they. That I, I I don't know what it is, but they seem only physical. A lot of them seem only only interested in the physical, physical aspect of martial arts. You got to get there's so much more than that, as you know, as Andrew knows. I'm going to keep bringing Andrew's name up because karate K aren't supposed to be as sensitive as he was. That's a trick. That's 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 the point right there. That's the point you need. You have to be able to put it all together. Yeah, I know I'm going off, off on another tangent now. Please do. But you don't put it all together by when you when you lock the door and you stop studying, you stop training. I mean, I was you have another great event coming up is a free training day. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna drop that right now. Because you get up there and I'm like I was what last time I started with Bruno, Bruno Trinidad. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm going to hold off right now because my body won't keep up. I'm bringing my, I'm bringing my staff and my demo team up next, next year. One of the things I want them to do is work with him. Mm -hmm. And for those of you who, who don't know Bruno, he's been on the show. He's a capoeira practitioner. Oh, yeah. I forgot to mention that, didn't I? Oh, sorry okay. about that. That's okay. Hey, that's my job. Because they can move that way. Whereas I'm not sure if I could move that way and portray it the way that he does. So not only the learning that I'm doing for me, it's for my students as well. I mean, I can bring... I, I'm, to, to slow down now would be a sin. That's part of my backwards life. 63 people getting ready to, to retire. Me, I'm getting ready to go. To go. I want to rock and roll now. There's so much 
so, so much light, so much less than life. I think every 20 years we reinvent ourselves anyways. Mm. So I'm going through another reinvention. I'm hit 60, I'm reinventing myself yet again. Now, Go ahead. Uh, some of the arts that I do, it's interesting, a lot of the arts that I do, because when you get down to it, each part of the art has to be practiced just like a front punch. And if you don't think, even with my colleague, each move should be practiced like a front punch. You you start, you, if you know how to do a really good front punch, that punch is gonna be devastating. If you only do it on the external, eh, so what? Same thing with every aspect of, of every art that I do, every art that you ever want to do. Of course, that's a lot of stuff. I, I feel my life is well, well balanced. I do Kali, I do Wing Chun, I do Northern Mentis, I do Shaolin. It's very balanced life, right? That's all I, all I do. That's all I want to do. It's, it's, it's a passion. Some call it ob obsession. Some call it insanity. But, hey, that's me. So let, let me let me ask this this one last question. And it's one of my favorites. So you have the opportunity to go back and spend just a few minutes with 16-year-old you. Have a conversation. Doesn't have to be about martial arts, but probably would be. What would you say? What would you want to share with 16-year-old you about whatever? About anything. How many minutes do I have to talk to him? A few. And I don't want to put too strong a label on it. Not hours, but more than, you know, it's not like it's five seconds. All right. In the matter of time that I would have, knowing what I know now, I would lay before him a grand scheme on how to perfect his martial arts. So much better. And what to do and when to do it. And what not to do. Don't climb that treehouse and jump out. You'll break your knee. That didn't work out. It doesn't, didn't end well. It's like I tell my students, find your, I, I tell my teenage students, let me go there. I tell my teenage students, I wish they'd li listen a little more, find your passion now. If you look at today's society, any passion that you find now can follow you through life. If you're 16 and you decide to change course, you can do that at any time. I opened my school when I was, what was I, 38? So I was no spring chicken. If, if you don't know what you want to do, go to college. And that's from a guy who went in the service. Hopefully you find your passion in college to go there and do what you're going to, this isn't to myself, this is to my students. So myself, I say, you're going to do martial arts, you're going to live martial arts, you're going to breathe it, or I'll come back and haunt you. They'll be like, oh. <laughs> but there are better ways than the way that I took to do things. That's what I tell him, and that's what I tell my students. Live your passion. Mine's the martial arts, and I'll continue to live this for, uh, two, I'm, uh, there was a uh, Chinese guy, I don't remember his name. Uh, they got records, they say, let's lift to 200, 250. I'm going to go to 251. So I got a few more years to spread the joy. Like I said in the intro, passion and a thirst for more, learning more, meeting more people, being more as a martial artist. And Tashi Warner has become someone that I look up to and... I'm glad that I got to learn more about him. I'm glad you all got to hear from him. Thank you for coming on the show. I know I'll talk to you again soon. Listeners, check out whistlekickmartialartsradio.com for all the show notes that we do. And while you're over there, maybe check out another episode or sign up for the newsletter. If you're up for supporting us and the work we do, remember, you've got options. You might consider buying one of our Amazon books, telling others about the show, or supporting our Patreon at patreon.com slash whistlekick. Are you interested in having me come to your school for a seminar? We do some fun stuff when we do that. Just let me know.
you've got the code podcast15 to get 15% off anything at whistlekick.com. And if you've got guest suggestions, topic suggestions, feedback in general, we want to hear it. Our social media is at whistlekick. My personal email, jeremy at whistlekick.com. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.